1919, when he's 25 years old, the British writer Gerald Brennan, after having earned a military cross in World War I for his valor, decides that he's sick and tired of the shackles of middle-class life in England and wants to, in his words, set off to discover new, more breathable atmospheres. He wants to live in the Mediterranean, but he chooses Spain over, let's say, Greece and Italy because it's cheaper. That is not for any romantic reason, not because of any book that he's read, but because he wants his officer's bounty or the stipend that he earned for his military service to last longer because he wants to, in his words again, spend a few years reading the books that he had collected. 2000. When he finally settles in, they arrive one day in a horse-drawn wagon. He wants to do this, he says, because he says he felt ashamed of being 25 and of having read nothing but a few novels and some poetry. Gerald Brennan is a book rants kind of guy. Self-educated. Educated through reading rather than university degrees. Okay? In one of his autobiographical books, not the one we're going to talk about today, but in one of them called Notes in a Dry Season, he writes, I have always been more of a learner than a knower. Gotta love that. Anyway, he ends up settling in in a town called Yegan of about a thousand inhabitants, 4,000 feet above sea level, overlooking the Mediterranean in an area called the Alpujarras, which is a part of Andalusia, a very rich, fertile part of Andalusia because it's watered or irrigated every spring by the melting snows on the peaks of the Sierra Nevada, which is the highest mountain range in Spain, even though it's in the south. He spends three years in this town and then another 12 years on and off. And that's where he gets the material for the book in question today, South from Granada, published by Gerald Brennan in 1957. Through a friend from the First World War, Gerald Brennan had ties with the Bloomsbury Group, which was that group of artists, intellectuals, writers, philosophers that hung out in England in the first half of the 20th century. People like John Maynard Keynes or the novelist Ian e. Forster, but also two of whom came to visit Gerald Brennan in Yegan, and he wrote about it. One of them was Virginia Woolf, and the other one was Lytton Strachey. Virginia Woolf, of course, is a huge figure in modernist literature. She wrote the two stream of consciousness novels, To the Lighthouse and The Waves, and she also wrote that great early feminist text, A Room of One's Own. There's a great scene or moment when she's visiting Brennan in Yegan, where he, where she's expressing her admiration for Beethoven, for his ability or the way he could edit his musical compositions, how he was capable of polishing them, of cutting away excess and making the best parts stand out. Apparently, according to Brennan, she couldn't do that, all right, that she had to use her what he called kaleidoscopic mind to rewrite something completely for scrap, from scratch, hoping to get it better. The second time, okay, also Lytton Strachey, who is most well known for his work called Eminent Victorians, about heroes from the Victorian age in England. People say that he put the pizzazz into biography. Okay, that he preceded the American New Journalists, which might be a bogus name if we take Lytton Strachey into account. People like Gay Talese, who wrote about, you know, the eminent American Joe DiMaggio, or Tom Wolfe, who wrote about the eminent writer, American writer Ken Kesey, or Norman Mailer, who wrote about the eminent actress Marilyn Monroe. Okay, anyway, Gerald Brennan admires Wolfe's writing. But he doesn't admire Lytton Strachey's writing so much. And at one point, he says about Virginia Woolf, she, he says, No other writer that I know of has put his living presence in his books to the extent that she has done. Okay? And then about Lytton Strachey, he says that he recorded himself with too poor fidelity in his literary works. So with those two statements both from south from Granada, he's basically telling us what he considers to be worthy in literature, okay? It's almost more important to him in terms of literary art, how the writer records his or her living presence 
in the book. It's almost more important than the subject matter itself. Personally, I buy into this philosophy. Very often when I'm reading nonfiction or when I'm reading memoir, I ask myself, could any like decent professional writer have done this? Is it sui generis? How sui generis is it? Okay. If a book is sui generis, if it's held together, if the glue of a book okay, is the living presence or the essence of a writer, then you can forgive, not only forgive, you can even like look forward to digressions. You can look forward to ramblings, okay, or tangents. Really, this is South from Granada. South from Granada is a hodgepodge, meandering book. It's this way, that way, it's a grab bag. It's a total grab bag, okay? I would say it's as much about him, okay, as it is about Spain, okay? So you forgive these digressions. You enjoy, you look forward to them. One critic called Gerald Brennan a brilliant interpreter of Spain. I like the word interpreter very much. He makes sense of the country for us without hemming and hawing, without qualifying too much. He's an extremely intelligent and psychologically perceptive interpreter. Not only of people, not only of locals, not only of the friends who come to visit him, not only of other expats who live in Alpujarras, but of peoples, of collectives, of nationalities, of how the Andalusians were before the Spanish Civil War, which took place between 1936 and 1939, but also of how the, you know, upper class British expat community in Granada was, you know, these relics from the tail end of the British Empire. There's this great section on the word duende, Duende, the Spanish term, I talked a little bit about that in my review of the book The Factory of Light by Michael Jacobs. I said that Michael Jacobs embodied Duende for me, okay? According to Brennan, Duende is, is something that happens when in moments of great emotion, an artist goes far beyond his ordinary powers. And great great definition of duende, a term that I don't think, I don't think there's a, a term that describes that in the English language. Also, he's very, very perceptive about the way Spanish view sex, both men and women. There's this, I think it's the best literary set piece, let's say, in South from Granada. It's a chapter called Almeria, and it's brothels. And he says that he wanted to call it a Don Juan of our time. It reminded me of that novel by M Mikhail Lermontov called A Hero of Our Time, which has this kind of Byronic anti-hero, this lugubrious nihilist, this sentimental kind of cynic talking about the game of love, how to seduce women, okay? or those great scenes in The Red and the Black, Stendhal's novel when Julian Sorrell converses with Prince Korosov, who gives him advice on love, okay? In this chapter, Almarie and his brothels, Gerald Brennan meets this Spanish guy named Augustine, who is this guide in what I guess you would call like a whorehouse crawl. And as he, they go on this whorehouse crawl, Augustine expounds on his philosophy of life and of loving, okay? Fantastic chapter. But you know, there are also wonderful pieces of travel writing. There are great sections on botany, on anthropology, on history. You know, in Tales of the Alhambra by Washington Irving, which I also reviewed in this series of videos on books about Spain, he says, you know, or asks the question, whatever happened to the Moors, where did they go? Well. Gerald Brennan explains what happened to them, how they've integrated into Spanish society. You know, he's like, I would say this social scientist who just threw himself into living like and in the world of the people that he's studying and that he can no longer keep a cold and detached point of view on them. And he sort of fills his insights or 
enlivens them or brings them to life, his insights and theories and interpretations with these clean, well-told, entertaining anecdotes, personal anecdotes. There's this one at the beginning, he, when he first comes to Spain, he's kind of like confronted with sort of the squalid, sordid, mean aspects that you sometimes see in often beaten path parts of Spain. And then suddenly he's in this inn and he, think he's gonna, he thinks he's going to go unfed. And then out comes this kind of pot of salt cod with rice. And like all the people staying, all the guests staying in this inn, sort of like pull up a chair around this pot, okay? And they carve out their little portion. They're no plates. They carve out their little portions. All these people sit around in a very dignified, kind of generous, courteous way, eating their portion of this pot with their hats on. And at that point, he says, you know, the warmth of the Spanish people hit me for the first time. So the book is filled with little anecdotes like that. You know, me, as I'm reading this book, having spent 17 years in Spain, it was fascinating, or it remains fascinating to me to think, like, how much of his interpretation of Spain still applies? You know, like, the way he describes the Spanish people, Spanish women is kind of sexy and passionate, but also kind of chaste, or, you know, the culture of Catholicism, or, you know, how the Spanish people in their cultural events kind of avoid anything sad, or how the Spanish people are stoic and sometimes apathetic before brutal violence. I would say, right, that if you want to get a sense of the way Spain is, and also be entertained, Okay, and also to get a sense of that sweet generis of writers. Okay, if you and, and reading sort of personal stories, travelogues, foreign residence books, okay, memoir. I'm not talking about journalism and history. Okay, personally, as a reader, like I'm, I feel like I'm fed much more by by interpretations or insight into people than I am into like cultural trends or historical events. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm pointing these books out. But if you want to get a sense, if you're the type of reader that I am, you want to get a sense of what Spain is, and I would read the three books that I've reviewed so far, but not in the order that I've re reviewed them, but rather in the order they were written. So first, Tales of the Alhambra by Washington Irving, which was published in 1832, okay? Then this book, South from Granada, which was published in 1957 by Gerald Brennan. And then, finally, Michael Jacobs' book, The Factory of Light, which was published in 2003. You know, despite globalization, despite globalization, the United States, where I'm from, and the people in the United States are very different than Spain or Andalusia, let's say, and the people in Andalusia. If that weren't the case, then there is no way that I would have felt inspired to write My Half Orange, a story of love in language in Seville. I just would not have been inspired if there weren't, if they didn't continue to be vast differences in character, in motivation, in philosophy of life between peoples. Anyway, check out South from Granada. You won't be disappointed.